So those of you who are expecting Tim Shank, sorry, I'll do my best to put on a Carolina accent and lose, lose some hair. I'm, I'm starting to work on it. Not there. But uh, he was uh, taken ill and is, he's out of the hospital now. The doctor said, good enough, but not good enough to travel. So I'm, I'm filling in for him, so I'll do my best to talk about sort of the dark, cold, and slow ocean. And, and uh, Tony really did a nice setup that if you look at a New Yorker cartoon from over 30 years ago, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. And that's what a lot of people still think. But I think one of the things I want to talk about is deep and deeper. So uh, if Tim were here, he would talk about that sort of the abyssal plain, the average depth of the ocean, a little over three and a half uh, kilometers. Uh, but he's really interested in the, in the deeps, the, the real, what he calls the Hadal zone, if you remember your Greek and Hades, uh, things like the Mariana Trench, uh, the Challenger Deep, the deepest part out in the ocean. Uh, just by comparison, look at the outline of Mount Everest there, uh, dwarfed by the sort of negative seamounts that we have. So we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the challenges uh, with those ecosystems. So the Hadal Zone, so here's sort of the, the blue areas, you know, sort of the average depth of the ocean, very flat. Uh, but when you go to the Hadal Zones, you see all of those uh, trenches start to appear. They look small, but if you add it up, it's the size of Australia. It holds most of the deep, deep water in the ocean or in these trenches. It's not uh, in other parts. Uh, and we don't right now have any vehicle that can explore those ecosystems. So we can explore the blue areas with uh, remotely operated vehicles or uh, human operated submersibles or whatever, but get into uh, the truly deep oceans uh, we can't do. So just kind of remember in the back of your mind uh, that ecosystem will come back to it, but we're also going to do a little bit of a tour through the, the physical oceanography here to understand that movement, that what's impacting uh, these deep ecosystems that Tony uh, talked about. So some of you may remember uh, Wally Broker uh, talked about the ocean conveyor, the conveyor belt that uh, moved waters, the cold, uh, waters that were created at the high latitudes sink, flow away from the poles, and then are upwelled in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, warm, and then return uh, back up. That's a very simple model. Uh, and you can look at a more recent uh, analysis by John Marshall and Speer. Uh, life is even more complicated than this diagram. So it's not a series of, of a very continuous set of belt, but a lot of uh, regions that are sort of loosely uh, connected that are moving and communicating what's going on in the atmosphere into this deep ocean that creates this balance between warmth from the sun that's, uh, sun that's captured at the equator and warms the planet, transported north where it's cooled, and then returns back uh, to maintain the ocean heat balance. And if we go to a slide. So we can kind of look at this animation, and one of the questions that uh, happens here is, you know, what, what's the ocean doing? Is it just responding to the atmosphere, cold air blowing off the, off the continents, uh, cooling this warm water that then sinks, and then that heat is transferred into the atmosphere and warms uh, northern Europe? And so some people talk about, is the ocean pulling, i.e. this cold water that's created at latitudes uh, sinks down? gets modified by melting glaciers on the land, particularly Greenland, and how does that affect this, what's called the overturning circulation? Or is it something that happens uh, as a result of mixing in the deep ocean? Because as you change the density of the water, you set up gradients, i.e. highs and low pressures, and moves that uh, water uh, down to the uh, lower latitudes. So the sort of push and pull argument is actually a question of time scale. They both are happening. That is, the ocean is responding to changes in its density at the surface, as well as the slower mixing that's happening in the middle of the ocean. This is an important thing to think ecologically because ecosystems respond on both sh slow, short time scales, that is, the responses to extreme events or chain outbreaks of uh, cold air, but they're also responding to these lower changes on sort of evolutionary time scales. And when you're talking about these very deep ecosystems, long-lived organisms, uh, very isolated changes in that can really have profound impact on, on the ecosystems as well. So 
we just don't know much. So we've gone from the Wally Broker nearly 30 years ago conveyor belt to Marshall's more recent complication. But even this model, this is a program that's uh, just started in the last couple of years, a uh, world's best acronym, OSNAP, uh, overturning in the subpolar North Atlantic program. Susan Lozier said her son developed the acronym. Uh, so new generation. Uh, it's really trying to understand what's going on. What's the connection between ocean and atmosphere, between low latitude and high latitude, and how is this going to change as we add more CO2 to the atmosphere, as we move to a, at least a summer ice-free Arctic, as we uh, deglaciate the uh, Greenland continent. And so we have, this is building on a US-UK measurement called Rapid Boca around uh, that you can see that lower line off Florida extending over to West Africa. Uh, OSNAP is hopefully another decadal scale uh, measurement system up uh, off Canada to Greenland uh, and then over to the UK. Mol many countries involved, US, Canada, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Germany, and China, uh, France as well, uh, trying to understand what's going on. But even this, where we see blue lines and you say water flowing, if you were at Susan Lozier's talk a couple of weeks ago in New Orleans, even here, the connection is much more episodic and much more complicated than we expected. But this is something we need to understand, uh, this connection. And so the issue, and Tony brought this up, is what's going on in the deep ocean? So these are looking at waters deeper than two and a half kilometers, uh, looking at a fairly simple model by Gebbi and Hypers, uh, showing that the South Southern Ocean, that is that area between, you can see sort of south of Australia, South America, and Africa, respond really fast to changes in the surface characteristics of the ocean. So does the North Atlantic on dec decadal time scales. But the North Pacific, the Northern Indian Ocean, uh, respond on sort of century time scales. So it's interesting to see how these changes in the atmosphere get transmitted into changes in the ocean and to think about uh, how that's uh, manifested within the ecosystem response. Once those changes happen, how long does it take everything to go back to equilibrium? Another fairly simple model, but looking at shift data and an inverse model, you can see that that response lingers for a very long time, particularly in the North Pacific. S Southern Ocean, Atlantic, uh, equilibrates more on sort of century time scales. North Pacific, Northern India, Indian Ocean, we're talking millennia. And if you look at data from IPCC, this is a bit of a modified version from Greg Johnson and Sarah Perky, uh, looking at waters deeper than four kilometers. Uh, you can already begin to see that in the Southern Ocean, you're beginning to see that response, that warming. The stippled areas, there's no significant change yet. It does take a long time. These are, you know, we have a few decades of measurements, but again, remember the response is 50 to 100 to multiple hundreds of years. But we're beginning to see in the areas of the ocean that respond fa faster, we're seeing that warming begin to take place. That has profound impacts not only on the ecosystem, but on the uh, consumption of oxygen. Not only does warm water hold less, but it starts to speed up the decomposition of organic material that's raining down from the upper ocean into these deep ecosystems. So let's go back into these hadal ecosystems. And remember that we had that, remember now we've talked about that horizontal dimension, but here looking at that vertical dimension, these deep ecosystems respond to not only what happens locally and internally in terms of the food supply, but they also respond to what's raining down from above. Uh, this ties into the uh, planned NASA exports program. Uh, we have this sort of, what I call the sort of drizzle and storms. There's that constant rain and stuff. But they're extreme events. Not only things like whales that die and sink, but spring blooms that happen in the North Atlantic and eventually decay and rain down. Uh, how those are going to change in response to climate change is what NASA is trying to do, is to understand those processes and how that's connected with remote sensing. And I'll just show what, what does it look like down there. This is from Nereus uh, two years ago at six miles depth, 8,000 meters, just to show what the bottom of that ocean looks like. And it's, it's an area that's hard to explore. But you can see that it does look like a lot of uh, 
Was it Plato that said it was mud and slime? There is a lot of that. But if you look closely, not only do you see large macrofauna, but you see burrows and little domes, and there's that mud is just full of life. And in fact, if you were to take a shoebox, you'll find over 200 species in that, that region. So every depth, every thousand kilometers deeper we go, the more we find in that ocean. This is uh, you know, what, what Tony would say. I'm looking at sea mounts and looking at those uh, physical connections. Uh, Tim Shank saying I'm looking at the negative sea mounts. I have the same problem of moving organisms from one to another. When, or when larvae move, that's a real key ecological response because I can colonize new areas, I can repopulate areas that have been, desert, been disturbed. Uh, these are larvae can't swim, so they're at the total mercy of those currents, so changes in the currents, change dispersal patterns. As we begin to acidify and deoxygenate, deoxygenate the water, they become at risk, so they're moving into harm's way, potentially. So we're starting to see this connection between the horizontal transport and the ecosystem processes, and larvae and dispersal are a key part of that. And this is just a sort of a little cartoon from uh, Lisa Levin and the Breeze, a paper from last year. There are lots of things going on. You saw the warming, the acidification, the removal of oxygen, and we'll hear from Samantha and others about fishing or trawling, uh, exploring minerals and removing them from the deep sea. There are lots of issues that can affect these ecosystems. But I want to bring it home to one last you know, sort of the favorite charismatic megafauna. This is a, 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 a super giant amphipod, Alachella gigantea, that was just recently discovered. You find a lot of these massive species at depth, and if you look closely in the lower right, uh, you see the one inch scale, that little tiny thing there on the upper left, that's what most amphipods, are, the actual size are, but at depth, at six miles down, uh, that's what they grow to. The interesting thing isn't just their coolness, but they're living in a zone where the pressure is the equivalent of putting a dozen hummers on a dime. When you start putting those pressures on a cell, normal things that cells operate under, like mitosis and meiosis, moving mitochondria, moving proteins around, folding proteins, break. They just can't move. There's not enough uh, room within the cell to actually do the normal cellular biology uh, that cells have to do. So what we found in these organisms is that they actually are full of these things called osmolites. Osmolites in some cells help pop up the cell, and we find them in a range of organisms that live in the deep ocean, the five to seven miles, that enables the cell to actually carry out its normal machinery and function. And it's actually now attracting interest from researchers like uh, people studying Alzheimer's, where there's also a problem with the protein foldings inside the cells that people are thinking maybe that's disrupting that normal cellular function. There might be some applications. So here are creatures in the most bizarre environments on the planet that actually might have everyday applications, and they're at risk. And to just say the key messages, it takes a long time to respond, but there are short-term impacts from what goes on in the upper ocean. We can break up the linkages between these ecosystems. Once those changes happen, they're there for centuries to millennia. Tony has pointed out it's a warmer, more acidic, and less oxygenated environment. And we really don't have the tools, not only the long time series, but just the tools uh, to get down there to observe what's going on. And I just want to say that Monday, last Monday at 9 a.m., I had all these people in my office saying, Tim can't show up, and let's put together a talk. So they really did all the work. Thank you very much.